We look forward to a very engaging and interactive discussion. And with that, I will turn things over to NBR's president, Roy Kamphausen. Roy, over to you. Thanks, Audrey, and good afternoon to our participants who are joining on the U.S. East Coast. Good morning on the West Coast and um, a very early morning to those joining from Asia. I am Roy Kamphausen, president of NBR. Welcome to today's event titled Assessing U.S.-China Deterrence Dynamics and Crisis Management. Our discussion will recap key findings from two recent NBR publications associated with our annual conference on the People's Liberation Army, or PLA. The two items that we'll be discussing here are available for free download online at our website, nbr.org, and are titled Modernizing Deterrence, How China Coerces, Compels, and Deters, and then secondly, China's military decision making in times of crisis and conflict. Uh, Jeremy will provide the, the web links in the chat box uh, for all to take a look at. In 2006, NBR first began partnering with the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College in the annual Carlisle PLA Conference. Since then, and in continuous cooperation with U.S. Indo Pacific Command over the last several years, NBR has overseen the convocation of 16 conferences and the publication of 12 edited volumes on a range of topics, from China's evolving approach to deterrence and U.S. China crisis management the PLA missions other than Taiwan and the people in the PLA, among many others. We're here to, today to discuss the findings and the lines of our two most recent PLA conferences held in 2021 and 2022. These volumes frankly could not be more timely considering the issues that the contributors addressed in their chapters, many of whom we'll discuss in greater depth here later today in, on, the pro, on the panel. Allow me at the outset to make three points that I think provide some context to many of the findings in the two volumes. The first is the apparent shifting nature of China's deterrent approach and appetite for greater risk. The PRC's simultaneous expansion of its nuclear arsenal and rapid modernization of its conventional military capabilities are what suggest ongoing and systematic shifts in China's deterrent strategy and raise important questions regarding the steps the United States itself needs to take to deter aggression and preserve the status quo. China's evolving nuclear force posture is a particularly important example. The 2023 DOD China Military Power Report estimates that the PRC will field a stockpile of 1,500 warheads by 2035 if it continues the current pace of its nuclear expansion. Reports also suggest that PLA rocket force units are spending more time on higher levels of alert and readiness, perhaps signaling a shift to a launch on warning posture. And finally, the PLA is fielding a growing number of so-called hot swappable systems, which pose extremely high risks of accidental escalation, especially considering the deliberate commingling of nuclear and conventional missiles, such as the EF-26, using the same launchers in the same units at the same missile bases. And a shifting strategic posture also has important ramifications for the potential for new kinds of freedom of action in the conventional realm as well. More broadly, these trends also require reassessment of China's willingness to incur risk to advance its interests and objectives in light of new capabilities. Once quite risk averse and wary of escalation dynamics as it pursued its objectives, the PRC is increasingly willing to use its armed forces as an instrument to achieve its aims in the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, East China Sea, and elsewhere, though seemingly without a deep appreciation for the inherent escalation risks entailed, even as they fundamentally seek to avoid conflict with the U.S. and the West quite a dynamic. The second theme concerns differing views of crisis management and response. In particular, the 2022 PLA conference volume produced several key findings on this on the topic of China's approach to crisis management and response, and noted the very different approaches taken by the U.S. and China. Whereas we in the United States tend to see crises as situational anomalies, which we seek to swiftly resolve, 
the PRC appears to embrace the instability brought on by sustained, if low level crises, regarding them as a feature and not a bug of the international system, itself affording opportunities to advance PRC interests. Looking at the regional environment today, China's comforting crisis is often reflected in the PLA's unsafe intercepts and unprofessional operational behaviors in interaction with US military, as well as with regional allies and partners. It almost goes without saying that the PLA Air Force's daily incursions in the Taiwan ADAs and median line crossings also highlight this trend. A third major theme from the two volumes is that the PLA continues to upgrade its military capabilities. The risks of crisis for the United States increase. The existing, albeit limited, channels of communication available to U.S. and PRC senior military defense leaders and officials to manage these unplanned counters and possible crises are largely dormant. The existing communication mechanisms, such as the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, Defense Policy Coordination Talks, China-U.S. Theater Commanders Talks, all were suspended following then-Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in August 2022 and remain frozen to this day. Beijing has also repeatedly denied meetings between the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and the PRC Minister of National Defense or the Vice Chairs of the Central Military Commission. Secretary Austin even noted at Shangri-La that a, quote, cordial handshake over dinner like that he experienced with PRC Minister of National Defense in Shankford is no substitute for substantive engagement. Now, to be clear, a meeting is not the end goal sought by the U.S., but substantive engagement, substantive meetings are an essential step and convey both to the PRC and the region that the United States is committed to a peaceful and stable region, free of the coercion that the PRC often trades in. In a minute, we'll turn to our panel of authors to discuss their findings in more detail. First, allow me, however, to thank my NBR colleagues for making this event, publication of the edited conference volumes, and the conferences that yielded those volumes all possible. First, of course, is Allison Sawinski, NBR's Vice President of Research. Our Publications Director, Dr. Josh Zimkowski, Senior Director for Events and Development, Audrey Mossberger, and deep appreciation to our NBR PLA Program Activities Project Manager, Jeremy Rauch, who will actually moderate the panel. Of course, we're also grateful to Indo-Pacific Command for the generous support of this important initiative. Thank you as well to Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Steve Sklenka, Deputy Commander of U.S. indo pacom and Ambassador and retired Army Lieutenant General Carl Eifenberry, who authored the forewords to the 2021 and 2022 volumes, respectively. And finally, thank you to all of the contributors to both volumes, several of whom we are delighted to have join us today. And for those in our audience who want to learn more about the PLA, consider joining an upcoming NBR-sponsored PLA Executive Education course with information available on our website or via direct communication with Jeremy Rouse. With that, I welcome you again and turn, turn the panel over to Jeremy. Well, thank you, Roy, for that terrific introduction. And I couldn't be of more agreement that both of these volumes have proved to be tremendously prescient. And I look forward to hearing how our distinguished group of experts here today interpret the, pre the present situation and recent trends and developments through the lens of their chapters written over the last two years. So as Roy mentioned, my name is Jeremy Rausch, and I am a project manager at MBR with our political and security affairs team. And it's my pleasure to formally kick off our panel discussion today and welcome the seven distinguished contributors to the 2021 and 2022 conference volumes here today. So I'll introduce everyone here at the start and then we can get started with the discussion. And I've asked the panelists to keep their remarks no longer than seven minutes each, so as to reserve sufficient time for Q&A with our audience online. And just to reiterate, if there's any questions that you have for the panelists, please send it in an email with your name and affiliation to events at nbr.org. So now I'll introduce everybody in the order that they'll present in, and please bear with me as there's a few people to introduce, but it will certainly be worth it. So starting with our 2021 authors, 
We have Dr. Dr. Andrew Erickson from the U.S. Naval War College. Dr. Erickson is a professor of strategy and the research director in the Naval War College's China Maritime Studies Institute. He'll be summarizing his chapter in the 2021 volume titled China's Approach to Conventional Deterrence. Next is Dr. Nicola Leveringhouse, who's a senior lecturer in war studies at King's College London. She'll be summarizing her chapter titled How China's Nuclear Past Shapes the Present, Ideological and Diplomatic Considerations in Nuclear Deterrence. And last but not least from our 2021 volume, we have Rachel S. Wynne O'Dell, who is now a foreign affairs analyst at the U.S. Department of State and was previously a research fellow in the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. She'll be presenting her chapter on struggle as coercion with Chinese characteristics, the PRC's approach to non-conventional deterrence. And now for our 2022 contributors, David Santoro is the president and CEO of the Pacific Forum and author, authored the opening chapter in the 2022 volume, How China Approaches Military Crises and the Implications for Crisis Management. Ziyang is a PhD candidate in the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He'll be sharing his chapter on how China leverages artificial intelligence for military decision making. And we also have Shu Xian Luo, who is an assistant professor in Asian studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa, as well as a non-resident China fellow at the Wilson Center. She'll cover her chapter on China's decision to escalate the 2012 Scarborough Shoal standoff. And last, but certainly not least, David Logan is an assistant professor of security studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He will present his co-authored chapter with Phil Saunders of the National Defense University on the implications of the PLA's nuclear expansion and modernization for China's crisis behavior. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Andrew to get us started today. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy and Roy and colleagues. It's a great honor to be here today to share uh, what are solely, obviously, my uh, personal views. Uh, in this already difficult and dangerous world, unfortunately, things are getting even worse. And a significant part of that is the conventional missile forces that are increasingly at the forefront of PLA high-end combat power. In recent years, we've seen new thinking, new guidance, and new developments uh, resulting in new risks that require a new evaluation, and that's the purpose of my chapter and my discussion today. Uh, we can see a significant organizational evolution over time here. Uh, the rise of conventional missiles into an official mission of the second artillery force uh, by the early 1990s following uh, the Gulf War as part of uh, dual deterrence and uh, dual operations, the, the mission uh, for the force. By 2011, by some estimates, conventional uh, missiles and systems outnumbered their nuclear counterparts uh, seven times uh, in, in China. Then in 2015, uh, Xi Jinping, under his uh, ambitious and determined uh, leadership, renamed the PLA rocket force, renamed the, the force to the PLA rocket force and elevated it to the status, uh, formal status of a, uh, of a service. Uh, since then, we've seen uh, further development as part of integrated uh, strategic deterrence, uh, a comprehensive concept that uh, seeks to develop and bring both uh, nuclear and conventional uh, capabilities uh, to bear uh, in concert with all manner of other uh, PRC uh, military capabilities and whole of, you might say, whole of uh, party, military, uh, state, uh, nation uh, approach. Uh, this has yielded a huge diverse arsenal uh, designed to uh, prevail in every possible uh, scenario, uh, ideally from Xi Jinping's uh, perspective, uh, in part by offering an answer uh, at every rung of uh, the conceivable escalation uh, uh, ladder. Um, ideally, from Xi Jinping's perspective, to advance his objectives uh, through coercion and intimidation, but by also being prepared to, uh, quote, fight and win uh, if, if called to do so. Uh, 
Uh, rapid development of hardware and doctrine uh, increases what were already uh, non-negligible uh, risks. Uh, PLA, uh, excuse me, uh, authoritative PRC uh, sources, uh, which I discuss in my paper, uh, discuss uh, the potential for uh, developing uh, conventional uh, ICBMs, uh, ballistic missiles with with global reach in a way that in language that appears to suggest that uh, China does not intend to uh, be left behind in those developments. And uh, I would argue may even play a role in uh, pioneering uh, them. Uh, there's also considerable discussion in PRC sources about uh, outfitting a range of ballistic missiles with the transformative technology of uh, hypersonic uh, glide vehicles which I regard as a more precise way uh, to describe, uh, quote, hypersonics. Uh, the reality is all ballistic missiles are hypersonic in some uh, fashion at some stage, so we need to specify those, uh, those terms better. Uh, already uh, uh, back in uh, 2004 with the publication of the doctrinal publication, uh, Science of Sec Second Artillery Campaigns in 2005 with Intimidation Warfare, uh, we can see strong and demonstrably authoritative uh, evidence of what I would argue uh, represents uh, a consistent uh, overconfidence, uh, a dangerous overconfidence on the part of uh, PRC uh, strategists uh, in terms of tailored signaling and uh, what you might call uh, calibrated deterrence. It seems to reflect uh, lessons taken that are almost the opposite of the way in which uh, Cuban, the searing Cuban Missile Crisis experience, uh, to some extent, uh, sobered up uh, strategic thinking uh, in the West uh, to a large degree. Um, meanwhile, we can see uh, very significant developments in both uh, personnel and testing and training. Uh, actions designed to enhance uh, China's uh, credible capacity to actually employ these systems in difficult uh, combat conditions uh, if the forces are called uh, to do so. Within uh, PLA rocket force uh, uh, personnel uh, career trajectories, uh, David Logan, my former colleague at the Naval War College and uh, valued uh, colleague today, uh, fortunately can speak to this uh, further in depth given his deep research, which documents that uh, experience in uh, at uh, conventional ballistic missile uh, force, uh, uh, PLA rocket force bases is increasingly a pattern uh, on the trajectory to uh, senior leadership in the PLA rocket force. In terms of testing and training, uh, the top end numbers are rather staggering. Um, I, I'm optimistic that we're about to see a new uh, Pentagon China military power report, uh, but even in the previous iteration, uh, we, can, we can see documentation that uh, in the year 2020 alone, uh, China launched more than 250 ballistic missiles, 250 ballistic missiles. Uh, that is, in total for that year, more than the entire rest of the world uh, combined. Unfortunately, and very concerningly in my view, China has, uh, has uh, uh, under Xi Jinping, has chosen to pair these meteoric uh, developments with uh, a lack of uh, pursuit of restraints and confidence building measures. A uh, very significant opacity overall, particularly regarding uh, important uh, details. Uh, rejection of meaningful engagement, uh, guardrails, uh, or, uh, or arms control uh, efforts. Um, PRC state media sources uh, always frequently trot out the trope of uh, the U.S. or other, uh, other allies uh, having a, quote, Cold War mentality. Well, if the PRC under Xi Jinping had a late Cold War mentality, at least, they would be uh, open to uh, discussing serious arms control measures, which currently is clearly not the case. 
Uh, in consequence, I'd like to close with the following uh, basic uh, recommendations. Um, I've published in a variety of uh, venues uh, my concern uh, with uh, the term uh, integrated deterrence. I'm far from the only one to have expressed these concerns, but on a constructive note, uh, let me suggest that whatever terminology uh, the U.S. government uh, chooses to use, what it most uh, unambiguously emphasize are two major things at the very least. Um, a credible military core to integrated deterrence or whatever it should be called, because, well, of course, we all want a whole of government approach, uh, the, the use of all, uh, all toward uh, a greater mission. Uh, what really undergirds that in the most difficult situations are the ultimate uh, military capabilities. And that must be clear both in word and, uh, and in deed. Finally, uh, extended deterrence of, uh, of our key allies is critical. Uh, they must not uh, doubt uh, that extended deterrence. And uh, equally importantly, uh, Xi Jinping and other PRC uh, decision makers must not doubt the credibility of that extended deterrence. Uh, this, I believe, is how uh, peace will ultimately preserve in what is unfortunately a very difficult time and a decade that is decisive and increasingly getting more dangerous. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, you've, ra you've raised a lot of very interesting points, especially on the question of conventional nuclear deterrence. So I'm pleased to turn it over to Nicola Leveringhouse to talk a little bit about her chapter from the 2021 volume. Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to revisit um, the chapter that I presented um, for the volume, uh, which really is about uh, thinking through the domestic political value of what I call in the paper grand nuclear ideas around defensiveness, things like no first use, retaliation. And these are historically grounded um, ideas. Um, and a key theme in, in, in my work since then um, remains looking at and tracking how China utilizes its nuclear path, so its own nuclear path and its own experience of that, uh, and how that informs present day. Um, and so I look at that mainly through the lens of commemoration. It's a big theme in my work. Um, and I would probably share Andrew's outlook. I think it's become gloomier um, because you can frequently read um, speeches by Xi Jinping and, and, and many newspaper articles uh, in Chinese that reference um, historical uh, programs in China, development programs like uh, the Liangdang Yixing program from the 1950s, and they talk about it very positively as an example for the contemporary space programs, for instance, in China. So the link between the history and the present day, I think, remains relevant and um, more so than, than ever, really. In the in the chapter itself, um, I um, I think I I, I make um, the core argument I make um, is that the bomb was posed a series of political problems for the party, um, and these problems, um, particularly, I'll, I'll lay out what these problems are in a minute. These problems led to a push for minimalism, uh, things like no first use, um, because the bomb was seen as a political liability rather than an opportunity for strategic development and superiority. So sort of the ideological starting block was very different uh, in China. So I spend time in the paper um, trying to unpack a series of debates within the, the party, the Communist Party in China, in the 1950s, an often overlooked period. I mean, usually this period gets usually a sentence of that in many publications. And I call this this story the low morale story i also have a posh term for it counter defeatism but the point is is that during this period you can find a number of ccp statements and documents that really lay out particularly in the period between 1950 and 1952 so this is before china decides to develop the bomb and this is before it gets engaged much more heavily 
in the Korean War, for instance, you see a lot of um, sort of doubt and a lot of worries around the effect of nuclear weapons as a political challenge ideologically to Maoist ideas, military ideas around warfare, but also at a very practical level affecting army recruitment um, and morale among cadres and within the party. So the point is, is that I'm making is that you can you can see this debate and, and you can see this being laid out in the party um, and ideas like no first use becoming in effect ideologically constituted right and they're, they're they're deliberately designed to be aligned in alignment with um broader military thinking that again is is ideologically ideological and that restricts already from a very early a early age the sort of military options that china has publicly at least um for strategic deterrence so so what does that mean for us today right i mean that's all very interesting um, and I think the first thing to take from that is that change is unsurprisingly very slow in such a political system. The CCP remains in place and any big changes, to these grand strategic um, ideas, these grand nuclear ideas very much is going to be driven from within that party system and the political purpose that these weapons serve, the domestic political purpose, therefore requires, I think, greater care and, and, and study. Um, so if, for instance, grand ideas like no first use lose political cap capital and they're no longer useful, then that is the time to sort of think about whether they're going to change that that lang language. And I guess my point is that I think worryingly, um, some of the thinking is changing. Um, there is sort of new political values being attached to nuclear weapons that didn't exist in the 1950s. Um, and so I guess I'll end with a sense of some of the policy implications of my paper would be to consider much more the shifting domestic political values that China attaches to nuclear weapons and how that changes how China practices and talks about nuclear deterrence. Um, I think for the US, um, discussions around, for instance, mutual vulnerability could be counterproductive because they could provide a political exit for China to break away from sort of more restrictive ideologically constituted ideas, such as no first use um, in the future. And I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I think you've raised a lot of important questions, especially as we think about the nuclear expansion, how that relates, how the view, how, how the party leadership's views on nuclear weapons are evolving and what that means for the future of China's nuclear force posture and its doctrine are very interesting. So in the Q and A, we'll be sure to get to a few questions in that, in that, in that umbrella. Um, so. I will now turn it over to Rachel Espino Dow to talk about her chapter on the PRC's approach to non-conventional deterrence. Thanks, Jeremy. Glad to be a part of this. And uh, I also want to just state right up front that I'm speaking today in my personal capacity. So my views don't necessarily reflect the views of the US government, or the Department of State. And of course, my chapter was based purely on open sources. Um, in my chapter, I was tasked with assessing the non-military and non-conventional tools that the PRC uses to deter and compel other countries. Now, this is a big topic, as arguably the majority of the coercion that Beijing attempts does not involve the use of the military. Thankfully, I didn't have to start from scratch, as there's been a lot of excellent work done on this topic by experts analyzing China's growing use of coercion across diplomatic, economic, informational, legal, and non-conventional political domains. The first part of my chapter essentially summarizes that literature. I won't delve into it here for time constraints, uh, but if you want more details, read the first part of my chapter, and more importantly, read all the great reports that I cite in the footnotes. Now, after summarizing that literature and laying out the what and the how of China's non-military coercion, I focus most of my chapter on the questions of who in the PRC party state executes all of that deterrence and compellence, and perhaps more importantly, why they do so. What is Beijing's strategic logic of coercion? Now on the question of who, my main argument is that in China's broader grand strategy and foreign policy, other party and state organs, not the PLA, their primary responsibility for executing the non-military dimensions of PRC coercive statecraft. Now this may seem like a pretty basic, obvious point at one level, but I think it's important to underscore because so much energy in the China watching community in the US tends to focus on PLA doctrine but I think sometimes we tend to assume the PLA's thinking on deterrence represents the PRC's approach to deterrence full stop. 
But in actuality, the PLA is just one part of the PRC's coercive apparatus and doesn't necessarily think about deterrence in the same way as other parts of that apparatus. Now, of course, the PLA does is embracing the concept of integrated deterrence which aims to draw on and combine diverse deterrence resources across the, the dime spectrum. Um, and the PLA is focusing, mo focusing more on non-conventional forms of deterrence, including uh, formulations of the three warfares that are more refined. This is the psychological, uh, media, and um, political warfares, or legal warfares, excuse me, and cognitive domain operations too, which is a concept that encompasses traditional media outreach and social media engagement as well as disinformation campaigns and various cyber activities. But although the PLA is getting more into the integrated deterrence business as it tries to shape how the PLA's actions, capabilities, and resolve are perceived, the vast majority of China's non-military deterrence is still done by other organs in the PRC party state. Thus, to understand the PRC's overall approach to deterrence, I argue we have to cast a wider net analyzing the writings and behavior of top CCP leaders, as well as various other PRC party state organs, especially in the foreign affairs apparatus. So I spend most of my chapter analyzing how senior CCP leaders and PRC foreign affairs leaders think about coercion. And that analysis results in four basic findings. First, the CCP does not often use the explicit language of deterrence, but instead complains about coercion by other countries and emphasizes the need to struggle against that coercion. Now, secondly, such complaints and the concept of struggle itself are longstanding themes in CCP theory, but they have been emphasized much more strongly during Xi Jinping's era. Third, there are some important differences between the CCP's concept of struggle and Western IR theory concepts of deterrence and compellence. And these differences can explain why the PRC sometimes persists in behavior uh, that is unsuccessful and self-defeating. And then finally, struggle does not wholly define the PRC party state approach to diplomacy. And there are other concepts such as the need to be flexible and pragmatic or exercise restraint that can be revived if the party perceives that doing so will help protect its own security and stability. So I'm gonna just spend, look a little bit more at each of these four concepts, these four basic findings. So the first finding is that contrary to the PLA, the CCP does not conceptualize or use the explicit language of deterrence. CCP doctrine is instead often phrased in narrative or descriptive terms and, and uses sort of exhortations and motivational language. This draws on the language of Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism, including rhetoric about contradictions and struggle in history, about truth-seeking systems and historical eras and trends. The party state's guiding texts are especially indirect when speaking about coercion. When they do talk about coercion, they generally do not conceive of China as an agent of coercion, but rather as a victim of it. They criticize the bullying, unilateralism, or hegemonism of other countries, especially the United States, and affirm that China will never exhibit such behavior. CCP leaders do stress the need for China to, in effect, deter such alleged bullying, but even here, they do not explicitly use the term deter. Instead, they call for China to resolutely oppose and struggle against coercion by other powers and to resolutely safeguard national interests. These are themes that are frequently repeated in PRC writings and CCP writings. My second finding was that complaints about coercion from other countries such as these are longstanding features of China's foreign affairs and were prominent before Xi Jinping came to power. Likewise, the concept of struggle is an important and longstanding one in CCP theory and has been used in the past to describe how China should defend its core interests. But the scope of an emphasis placed on these themes during the Xi era is distinctive. Senior party and state foreign officials in the Xi era have amplified these themes. And for example, at a study session on Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy in 2021, then Foreign Minister Wang Yi called for, quote, tit for tat struggle and effective measures to safeguard China's interests. So in, in so doing, he was drawing a direct connection between Xi's emphasis on struggle and the coercive measures that China has been applying across multiple domains in recent years to uh, respond in a tit for tat way to the coercion of other states. Now, the third point was that struggle in the face of opposition and safeguarding interests in the face of threats are the closest concepts in CCP theory to concepts of coercion in American IR theory and military doctrine but they're still not a perfect or direct analog. 
because struggle is referring to a structural tension, and a normative relationship that's lacking in the concept of coercion. Coercion and its subcomponents, deterrence and compellence, are both rooted in the core question of power as conceived in US political science. How does actor A get actor B to do something that actor B would not otherwise do? Struggle, however, is a concept rooted in the Marxist Maoist tradition that refers to the structural tension that exists between opposing forces and the conflict between those forces. So to struggle is to resist the structural oppression of existing forces in order to overcome them. These differences between the concepts of struggle and coercion have important implications for PRC foreign policy. At a theoretical level, actions that do not have a clear causal impact on other countries' actions may still be val valued as instances of struggle. They could serve both bureaucratic purposes, such as lower level officials signaling their resolve and loyalty to senior party leaders, and popular legitimacy purpose, purposes, such as the party evoking a rally around the flag effect among the populace and establishing itself as the defender of the people's honor and pride against external attack. Now, this dynamic can explain some of the puzzles of China's coercive diplomacy and economic statecraft, especially the question of why Beijing at times persists in coercive behavior that doesn't achieve its objective and instead damages, damages its image and provokes counterbalancing by other states. Uh, this framework paradoxically seems to presuppose that deterrence will probably fail and the opponent will continue to engage in unwanted behavior due to structural contradictions. This is why CCP leaders stress the need to engage in prolonged and difficult struggle that's resilient to such failure. They may at times be measuring success in struggle less by the responses of other states than by how vigorously and self-confidently PRC officials are resisting threats from other actors. This could mean that deterrence failures for the CCP actually validate the struggle mindset since resistance and counterbalancing are likely not interpreted as direct short-term reactions to PRC's coercive behavior, but rather as products of deeper structural contradictions. Now, my fourth finding is, is also important to emphasize because as I was uh, writing this chapter in 2021 and 2022, I think that a dynamic I've just described was pretty clear in China's largely self-defeating wolf warrior diplomacy. At the same time, I concluded with this, with this fourth finding that struggle does not wholly define the PRC, start, the PRC party state's approach to diplomacy. There are other strands and concepts in PRC statecraft, such as the need to, quote, be flexible and pragmatic or exercise restraint, as well as the goal of creating, quote, a better external environment for national rejuvenation. So these are also important longstanding concepts in China's diplomacy. And I argued that although an emphasis on struggle is currently ascendant in CCP guidance, in the future, the CCP could either de-emphasize struggle relative to those other ideas or strengthen the current emphasis. So it could really go either direction. And I would submit that since I wrote this chapter and in the wake of the 20th Party Congress last fall, and China's economic struggles of the past year, we have seen a partial limited rebalancing in PRC statecraft toward more flexible and pragmatic approaches designed to create a better external environment. To be clear, the struggle is still very real, but the PRC party state, state has shown that it at least has some capacity to course correct, even if that may be too little too late. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, again, another presentation with a lot of food for thought. So now we'll move on to the uh, first presenter from the 2022 volume, uh, David Santora. David, go ahead. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you uh, to NBR for inviting me as a contributor to this important volume. Uh, so my chapter focuses on crisis management. Uh, so so why, why crisis management? Um, uh, a few months ago, I, I wrote a, a journal article uh, on China and nuclear arms control, where essentially our, our, um, my, my core argument is that it's not going to happen anytime soon and we should manage expectations in, in this area. And I think people have come around and accepted that, yes, that's true, we, we're not going to get arms control with China anytime soon. But the response has been, okay, well then if we can't get arms control, we really need to uh, and should do crisis management. And so that's why the chapter focuses or zooms in on, on crisis management to see uh, essentially what we can expect in that area. 
And uh, my chapter, which is based on uh, recent Chinese writings on crisis and military crisis in particular, basically says that if you think crisis management with China is more realistic than arms control, then maybe think again. And um, so the, the chapter makes essentially three three points that I'll, I'll present here uh, briefly, and I'll, I'll keep this brief. Uh, point number one, uh, Ch China has been focusing a lot more on crises and military crises in recent years, a lot more than, than in the past. It's done a lot of thinking about, again, uh, the concept of crises, but, but military crises in particular, and much of that thinking is laid out in the 2022 uh, science of military strategy. Uh, China is also concerned about the outbreak of crisis with the United States in particular, over Taiwan, over the Korean Peninsula, and uh, over the East and uh, South China Seas. And, and Rachel mentioned that uh, China really views crises as struggles, uh, which is essentially distinct but not completely removed from the normal course of events. And it says that today's environment is very fertile for, for crises and for military crises. So that's point number one. Point number two, China identifies a two-phased approach to military crises. Uh, the first phase is the prevention phase, and the second phase, uh, which we could call management, but China calls that handling. So let me first describe the prevention phase. Um, essentially, China defines prevention as, and I, and I quote, the targeted preparations taken in advance to prevent the occurrence of military crises. So the, the prevention phase is actually an active phase. And China even talks about the need to, quote, pre-manage crises. China also talks about the, um, con the conduct of actual actions in the prevention phase, including combat drills. And so, in other words, the goal of prevention is both to stop crises from developing and to actually prepare in, in, in the event that they actually do develop. And this is captured by the... Um, war control terminology. So that's the prevention phase. Um, let me describe uh, the handling phase. And here the goal is, quote, to control and guide the developments of a crisis, uh, again, a quote, in the direction that is beneficial. And so to do that, China favors, um, talks a lot about political and diplomatic means, but it also stresses the importance of military means and the role of deterrence, a lot more than in, than in the past. And so, again, at the, at that, during that phase, um, very entrenched in uh, Chinese thinking is the idea of, of uh, control, controllability and, and, and a, a um, strong confidence that uh, managing crises has or can have uh, an engineering solution. Chinese writings talk about the virtue of uh, military restraint as well. And this is especially true when it comes to nuclear weapons. Now, what's unclear is whether the current so-called crash nuclear buildup will change that. But this is one area where military restraint uh, has been talked about at, at length and, and still is. And, you know, I, I've been involved in a number of track two and track 1.5 dialogues and what we hear from um, uh, the Chinese side is that uh, whatever is going on is not changing China's current policy and strategy when it comes to nuclear weapons. Um, having said that, um, despite the fact that, again, China talks about the virtue of military restraint uh, generally and also specifically when it comes to nuclear weapons, what does transpire is that in the crisis handling phase, what you see is both an interest in managing a bad situation from uh, deteriorating and also strategizing to secure and even advance Chinese interests. And that uh, latter goal is, I would argue, a lot more important than the management part. So let me move on to the third point, which is essentially about implications uh, and, and ask the question, what does that actually mean? 
So I think one of the key findings is that the, the United States and China have fundamentally different views of uh, crisis in general and military crisis in particular, and also very different approaches to, to, to those problems and therefore to crisis management. Uh, Roy mentioned that in, um, in his introduction, essentially in the United States, we see crises as problems to be managed or problems to be resolved, whereas China only does that to, uh, to an extent, it also views them as opportunities to advance its, its interests. And another way of saying this is that China is more interested in winning crises, quote unquote, than in managing them. And in fact, it also thinks that escalation might be useful to again, win, um, win crises. Um, and then in addition to this, China is skeptical uh, of crisis management mechanisms because it, it, it assumes or thinks that it's essentially a trick by the United States to, again, prevail in a crisis. Um, so there's a little bit of projection here, thinking that the United States approaches crisis the same way as, as China does. So to China, avoiding or managing crises and escalation is essentially the responsibility of the United States. And that's why China uh, talks about crisis prevention more so than about crisis management. The idea is that the United States should essentially behave and there would not be any crises. So what happens now? Uh, what should we in the United States at least do? Um, and, and here I have three quick points. Number one, I don't think that this analysis suggests that we should give up on engagement of China. And these issues are too important um, and in particular, I think it's uh, important to increase communication at the operational level, which uh, uh, is essentially inexistent. Uh, but, and this is point number two, we need to be very clear eyed about what can be achieved. Um, whatever we developed with China in this, in this area, um, we are not going to resolve problems with those mechanisms. What we can hope to do is probably better communicate positions and intentions. And in other words, what I'm what I'm arguing is that if we do get uh, if we do develop those mechanisms, we should use them to support deterrence, um, which is the dominant force, as as everyone knows, in U.S. Uh, China relations these days. So again, let's do those mechanisms but for communication purposes, to communicate positions and intentions. And that's the, that's the core uh, recommendation of, of the chapter. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Um, so to make sure we have enough time, we'll move right along to the next presenter, uh, Ziyang. Hey, everybody. So my paper deals with how China leverages artificial intelligence for military decision-making. Uh, now, allow me to provide a brief summary of the paper and hope to engage further um, during the Q&A. So, in recent years, China has designated AI development a national priority. The use of AI has benefited the regime in various capacities, especially in terms of defense and security. So, looking ahead, AI will be a force multiplier of the, for the PLA, an organization critical to ensuring PRC regime survival. My analysis of the Chinese conceptualization of AI's role in military decision-making and recent gains in developing AI technology for military use finds that the progress of China's AI development for military decision-making is limited. So in this research, I first review how Chinese military thinkers envision future wars. Then I look at how these thinkers position AI in future conflicts with a specific emphasis on decision-making. I find Chinese writings expressing a strong interest in intelligent command and control. However, the development of such systems is still at an early stage and future applications of intelligent decision-making will be widely applied first at the tactical level, then further upwards at the campaign level, and finally at the strategic level. Uh, to test out new systems and platforms, the PLA and the Chinese government have organized AI competitions to evaluate intelligent decision-making systems, spot new talent, 
and build connections among AI industry participants. There are several major competitions, although some have tapered off after a year or two. But the national wargaming competition remain consistent through occurring on an annual basis. And through these competitions, we have seen how Chinese AI decision-making systems operate. However, uh, some high-performing systems have since disappeared from the public eye after successful performances at these venues with no further updates. So there are nu numerous positive and negative factors that will affect the development of AI technologies for military decision-making. Uh, the challenges include corruption in the PLA, centralization of power in the hands of one man, which is C, uh, the experiences of PLA officers in working with AI decision-making systems, uh, the politicization of the PLA, and finally, the domestic and domestic political economic situation in China. Uh, nonetheless, despite these factors that can challenge the uh, integration of AI decision-making technology uh, with the PLA, the AI R&D is still a national priority that receives firm state backing. Uh, with that being said, I conclude that the widespread adoption of AI technology to enhance PLA decision-making appears to be realizable in the medium term rather than the short term, which is within 10 instead of five years. A few policy implications from the paper is that the Chinese government has made AI R&D a national priority and is poised to commit further resources to developing AI for military decision-making that will enhance the capabilities of the PLA and make a more serious threat to Indo-Pacific stability. Although current progress in developing AI for military decision-making is limited, advancements in the coming years are certain, which will bolster Chinese civilian and military leaders' confidence in undertaking military action. And uh, last but not least, among the major impediments that will hold back China's AI ambitions, Xi Jinping's policy missteps and his adverse influence on, Ch on the Chinese state and military institutions present the greatest encumbrance. On this point, foreseeable domestic difficulties under enduring despotism could become detrimental to the PLA's modernization and preparations for future AI-enabled warfare. Um, we'll go on to Xu Xian. Thank you, Jeremy, for uh, having me. So in my chapter, I was asked to examine China's decision to escalate the standoff with the Philippines in Scarborough show in tw uh, back in 2012. Uh, so in this chapter, uh, I argue that this decision should be understood as a result of China uh, weighing and making a trade-off between its anticipated domestic and international costs that pull the country's decision in different directions i.e. the potential domestic political uh, domestic political costs and backlash will create a uh, create an incentive for escalation whereas potential geopolitical and reputational damage created pressure on Beijing to de-escalate. So the 2012 Scarborough Show standoff represents a case in which you know uh, China's perceived a, a low international cost versus high domestic political costs led Beijing to opt for escalation. Um, at the beginning uh, of the standoff, at the time, Beijing was facing a domestic push to harden its posture um, on maritime disputes, which started before she ever started his first term. And at the same time, Beijing was facing um, ambivalent responses from other regional stakeholders, especially the United States and ASEAN member states. So, um, but as the standoff uh, continued, uh, America's reluctance to reaffirm its defense commitment to the Philippines and also the lack of unity in ASEAN's response with Beijing to believe, to calculate that an assertive posture uh, was unlikely to incur substantial um, international costs. So this perception tipped China's calculation toward the mask end and incentivized an escalation. Um, so, China, uh, so China employed a multi-prone non-military escalation strategy against the Philippines during standoff to signal its resolve at the same time avoiding unwanted, military, uh, unwanted militarizing uh, the situation. Um, but and also during uh, during the escalation, Chinese the Chinese my study find that uh, the Chinese propaganda tend to overstate 
intensity or the negative impact of the normal trade escalation uh, on the Philippines for you know the consumption the for the mass consumption of Chinese uh, Chinese public. But during this uh, uh, this escalation, the PLA was not uh, was not directly involved because it's com uh, it, it employs completely non-military uh, agencies to uh, for for that purpose. So now, with respect to the uh, the role of PLA specifically during uh, this episode, um, it was not uh, the, my study found I didn't find information I didn't find evidence showing that the PLA was as as, as openly vocal as other Chinese maritime security agencies such as you know, the maritime law enforcement actors. Um, and beyond, but beyond this particular incident, uh, the PLA is capable of shaping the broader discourse within Chinese foreign and security policy community, and also in the public sphere through its push to harden China's approach toward defending its sovereignty and jurisdiction in the maritime domain. So I must have concluded that, uh, with the policy, uh, uh, with, with uh, the impo policy implication, uh, with several policy implications, it shows that while China has demonstrated a growing level of assertiveness while uh, handling maritime, when handling its maritime disputes, uh, its way of managing these disputes is shaped by competing expectations and costs um, generated by multiple audiences that include but are not limited to the PLA. And to the extent that China strives to uh, credibly, credibly signal its resolve while uh, avoiding projecting an image of belligerency among its smaller neighbors, uh, my study shows that uh, stakeholders in the region still have leverage to shape China's press behavior in South China Sea by tipping its cost-benefit calculation toward the international end. So external efforts were likely to be most effective when, uh, when a clear, strong U.S. response combined with a un unified voice from ASEAN. I think I'll stop here and look forward to further discussion. Thanks, Christian. And before I turn it over to David, just a reminder to our to the folks in the audience to please send through any questions you have, either using the chat box or send it to PSA events at nvr.org. Um, and so to round us out for our presentations, I'll turn it over to David Logan. All right, thanks, Jeremy. And um, thanks to the entire NVR team for putting this together. And I would encourage everyone in the audience to really read these contributions. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge and insights within each one of them. So in our chapter, um, my co-author Phil Saunders and I examined China's ongoing nuclear modernization and expansion and considered what are the implications for this nuclear expansion on China's crisis behavior, its conflict behavior, how China might use nuclear weapons in the future, and what are some of the interactions across different military domains that this expansion might generate. Um, as Roy alluded to in his opening remarks, China's in the midst of an unprecedented nuclear modernization and expansion, and I'll, for the sake of time, spare the details, but China's nuclear forces are increasingly larger. They are more diverse across military services and delivery systems. They are significantly more technologically sophisticated, and they are operated at higher levels of readiness. So in our chapter, we look at recent Chinese writings on the nuclear expansion um, and draw on some of the literature about how nuclear expansions affect state behavior generally to think about what is this might mean for Chinese foreign policy and national security policy choices in the future. And today, I just wanted to highlight three implications for China's crisis and conflict behavior, three implications for China's nuclear behavior and how it might use nuclear weapons, and three implications for U.S. policy. So first, what does the nuclear expansion mean for China's crisis and conflict behavior? The first implication that we identified is that a larger and more diversified nuclear force will likely make Chinese leaders more confident in their secure second strike capability and therefore less susceptible to potential U.S. nuclear threats and intimidation. We see Chinese leaders um, expressing concerns that the United States might be the first to resort to limited nuclear first use against China in order to offset a perceived American conventional inferiority in the Western Pacific. However, a larger and more diversified Chinese arsenal would be more survivable, potentially enhancing deterrence against the U.S. first strike, and therefore decreasing the feasibility of U.S. damage limitation strategies that might be adopted towards China. The second implication is that as the nuclear balance becomes increasingly stable, the likelihood of conflict at lower levels of intensity may increase. Scholars have long recognized an interaction between the probability of conflict at different lungs, uh, rungs of the so-called escalation ladder, 
the stability instability paradox tells us that greater uh, stability or parity at the strategic nuclear level, the greater, uh, excuse me, the lower the stability at the conventional level and the greater the potential for conflict at those lower levels of violence. So with the nuclear expansion, um, we may see greater instability at lower levels of violence. If China's current or previous nuclear inferiority relative to the United States helped restrain Chinese conventional aggression, then a larger and more survivable nuclear arsenal that produces a more favorable balance from Beijing's perspective could serve as a nuclear shield behind which China might be able to engage um, in escalation because it views lower risks. The third implication is that as the nuclear balance becomes more equal, um, depending on our assumptions about you know, how far the nuclear expansion will go, the conventional balance may become more important. So if Chinese and American leaders perceive themselves as locked into a nuclear stalemate, then nuclear escalation may become viewed as uh, an impractical tool for compensating for conventional weakness. And this could help insulate the conventional balance from nuclear dynamics. This would increase the likelihood that the conventional balance would therefore influence the outbreak and the course of any potential crisis or conflict in the future. So um, in addition to thinking about what does the nuclear expansion mean for Chinese crisis and conflict behavior, we also considered what does it mean for how China might use its nuclear weapons in peacetime and also during crises and conflicts. Uh, here I wanted to highlight three implications um, that we discussed in more detail in the chapter. And the first implication for the use of nuclear weapons is that China is increasingly likely to use its nuclear arsenal as a tool for bolstering its prestige, both for domestic and foreign audiences. And I would encourage anyone interested um, in these dynamics to read um, Nicola's contribution and a lot of the other great work that she's done in this area that she alluded to earlier. Um, and there is a significant amount of evidence of Chinese media, military reporting, um, and senior officials, both in the PLA and in the party, highlighting the technological achievements and military capabilities of China's nuclear and strategic forces as a marker of China's status. If Chinese leaders um, believe that a larger and more capable nuclear force improves China's status, um, they may make greater references to them, not only in peacetime, but also in crisis, which could generate audience costs if China does not then use them in some way. Second, China could use its nuclear forces during peacetime and crises to challenge U.S. extended deterrence commitments and to reduce the likelihood of U.S. allies intervening in a regional crisis or conflict or U.S. allies and partners allowing U.S. forces to operate from bases within their territory. Um, I don't think that we've, I haven't seen explicit um, language highlighting this as a goal of the nuclear expansion, but it is something that becomes more credible if China were to make a decision to use its nuclear forces in this way. Third, the nuclear expansion and modernization could change the options available to China to engage in nuclear signaling with a fully mature nuclear triad consisting of land, sea, and air-based platforms. China would enjoy new options for signaling, such as shifting to a launch on warning posture, increasing its nuclear alert status, deploying forces to the field, such as dispersing mobile missiles, flushing um, nuclear-armed SSBNs from their ports, or redeploying nuclear-capable bombers. And all of these signaling uh, choices may have important implications for crisis and conflict escalation. So finally, to close, what, what does this mean for U.S. policy? I wanted to highlight um, three implications, and they don't always point to I think very clear cut choices, but at least considerations that US policy needs to take into account. The first, which was alluded to um, in earlier discussions is that uh, US policy responses to China's nuclear buildup will in part depend on the perceived feasibility of maintaining US nuclear superiority vis-a-vis -vis China and the perceived benefits of doing so. So if US decision makers conclude that maintaining superiority is both valuable and achievable, then the U.S. may choose to forego strategic nuclear arms control with China in pursuit of U.S. nuclear advantages. If, on the other hand, U.S. policymakers conclude that China's quest for a robust second strike capability can't be stopped um, and that mutually assured destruction would stabilize the relationship to some degree, then uh, the United States 
might work to manage nuclear competition with China rather than trying to offset it. The second implication is that given that China's nuclear buildup lowers the perceived escalation risks of conventional military conflict and that it increases the importance of the local conventional balance, the United States may need to invest more in developing regional conventional forces, which would be more usable and more flexible in a crisis or a conflict, rather than potentially trying to offset the nuclear buildup. And third and finally, um, China's nuclear modernization and expansion may soften the trade-offs involved in a potential U.S. recognition of mutual nuclear vulnerability with Beijing. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll stop there and uh, turn it back to Jeremy. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, David, and thank you to all of our panelists for their terrific presentations. Uh, so I'll give the audience a few more minutes to send in a few questions. We have, we've received a couple so far, so I just want to give everybody the opportunity in case they haven't asked a question yet. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that tries to tie together a few different papers. The, the folks that come to my mind that are best positioned just based on the research that they've done for this are probably Andrew, Nicola, uh, and David Logan and David Santoro. So Andrew, you stipulate in your chapter that although the PRC's approach to integrated strategic deterrence encompasses both the nuclear and conventional elements, as well as the broader whole of party, society, nation approach, um, perhaps the conventional argument, the conventional capabilities remain the most important. And so I'd ask you to expound on that just a little bit more, especially in light of the nuclear expansion and the force posture changes that we're witnessing. And then ask maybe David, uh, the Davids and uh, Nicola to, if for the sake of debate, why might that not be the case? Why might the nuclear expansion and the, and the posture changes that we're seeing suggests that perhaps the pendulum is shifting in the nuclear direction. Um, and if that's not the case, why why not? And what do these changes mean? Um, so I'll turn it off. I'll probably let Andrew start and then please go ahead and jump in as you see fit. Jeremy, thank you for that important question. Uh, I didn't want to convey uh, the impression that I didn't think uh, China's nuclear forces were uh, of extreme importance. A major challenge that I for, uh, faced in the course of researching and writing this chapter is, especially in uh, strategic and doctrinal writings, it's often very difficult to disaggregate uh, PRC uh, views and arguments about nuclear versus conventional uh, forces, particularly when talking about deterrence. So my focus on uh, on conventional systems is uh, is partly a product of being asked to focus on that in the chapter. That being said, um, I do think uh, conventional systems are of tremendous importance for China. First of all, uh, they are far more numerous. Uh, second of all, uh, they are far more world leading, at least in their numerical nature. Um, by now, it's quite clear that China has the world's largest uh, conventional uh, ballistic and mis uh, ballistic and uh, cruise missile uh, forces uh, in, in aggregate, and that's very that's very significant. Uh, if I won't take too much time from the folks here who are focused on nuclear aspects, but just to underscore, if I were allowed to cover both, I would have a lot to say about uh, nuclear systems as well, particularly as. Uh, Xi Jinping's nuclear weapons policy represents, to me, a striking departure from both what his predecessors have authorized and also what people like me were told for many years by PRC interlocutors who, uh, who uh, said a whole bunch of sweet nothings, uh, whatever they, their intention might have been or their knowledge might have been, and emphasized continuity and numbers, no significant departure. Well, uh, that significant departure is now underway with the ramp up that uh, that Roy uh, mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, session. It is quite significant. And as the China Military Power Report itself emphasizes, it's putting China on track to, by some measure, uh, be broadly speaking in the same league as uh, the United States and Russia as the third, uh, the third leading nuclear power. So I hope that serves as a good segue uh, to my colleagues' discussion of the nuclear side. Thank you. 
Thanks, Andrew. And I'll let anyone who wants to unmute just jump right in. I can jump in if that if that's okay. So I'm I'm not going to disagree with Andrew. Uh, in fact, I agree with him. What I would say is that uh, my sense is what we are seeing right now in the nuclear domain is she deciding that uh, nuclear weapons matter and the arsenal needs to be built up. Um, I, I, and I know David Logan has done a lot of work on, on this, but my, my sense, uh, this is just a sense, is that um, she has directed um, its people to build that up and strategy will come later. Um, uh, happy to be corrected, but that's that's the general sense. Now, if I were to guess what um, he is trying to achieve, um, I would say that um, the goal is to essentially entrench the United States in a situation of further mutual vulnerability to be able to do more at the conventional level. And so I guess this is where I agree more with Andrew uh, that the, 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 the sort of war fighting tools are really more in the conventional domain. Um, but that being said, I would say that there is potential um, for nuclear use, um, A, to give the U.S. pause before an intervention uh, or to stop one short uh, that has begun. And I worry uh, especially about um, essentially China having drawn the wrong lessons of, of from, from the Ukraine situation, which um, essentially this would be she um, concluding that uh, nuclear weapons have deterred the United States from, from intervening and that they can be used uh, for, for uh, that purpose. Um, so they are, nuclear weapons will be more prevalent in, in um, in, the, in that sense, uh, at a minimum, and as I said, I think they could also be used, but I, I would agree that um, the the sort of focus for uh, of of, of, of um, war fighting tools are definitely in the conventional domain. Okay. Jeremy, if I if I can add to that um, to to build off of the previous statements, I agree with. David's comment about um, the nuclear expansion in part being driven by a desire to lock the United States into this greater mutual vulnerability and to use it as essentially a nuclear shield that makes the world safe for conventional aggression. And so I would um, recommend some other work that Phil Saunders and I have done recently with National Defense University Press, which tries to look at what are some of the underlying drivers behind the nuclear expansion. And we really found um, three drivers that were most compelling. One, uh, maintaining the survivable second strike, which is you know, the greatest uh, form of continuity with China's historical approach to nuclear weapons. Two, bolstering China's prestige and status. And then three is using it as a nuclear shield um, in order to decrease the vulnerability of China to any potential US nuclear threats and make it easier to operate at the conventional level. So I think when I think about the expansion, um, this is simplifying a little bit, but I think of it as on the one hand, potentially reducing some inadvertent escalation risks, because previously there were concerns that um, if China was very anxious about the survivability of its nuclear forces, particularly its strategic nuclear deterrent, then this could introduce very dangerous user lose pressures um, to Chinese leadership, especially given the concerns about potentially entangled conventional nuclear forces that Roy mentioned at the outset. But on the other hand, um, it gives China new options. And so it could increase the ability to engage in deliberate nuclear signaling, even you know, demonstration strikes, which just weren't really technically as feasible in the past. And I also worry about the expansion, just loosening some of those technical constraints creating new opportunities for the PLA um, or other sort of entrepreneurial bureaucracies to expand the role of nuclear forces in the PLA, in China's national security strategy. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't have 
very hard evidence of this, but I, I'm inclined to agree with David this, that this idea that the expansion came first and then strategy or policy will come second. Um, but without a very sort of coherent view about, you know, what, how they'll be operated, that creates opportunities in the future, maybe for, for shifts in strategy that aren't currently envisioned, but now these technical constraints have fallen to the wayside. Great, thank you. Perhaps I'll just jump in at the end there and just and just say that I think the the point I was trying to make was that I think we need to emphasize more in our thinking how the public and domestic political value of nuclear weapons have increased. And especially so um, in the Xi Jinping era. And I think that often gets lost in a lot of the technical, very important but technical discussion. Um, and I think I made the point earlier that, um, you know, whereas at the beginning, when a lot of these foundational ideas were being put forward, um, you know, it was seen as a liability and not as an opportunity for thinking strategically, for, you know, about the bomb and superiority. Um, it was seen as as a problem for unity in the party, right? And that's no longer no longer the case, quite clearly, right? Um, and so, therefore, I think understanding what Chinese thinking, how it's shifted on matters around, for instance, nuclear war, whether that should be fought or not, what are the ethical grounds around that? What are party thinking about deliberate, not inadvertent, deliberate escalation, right? Um, how does it distinguish or not between threats and signaling, right? Particularly taking, for instance, views on the recent on the ongoing war in Ukraine. And I think it's it's having those kind of questions and putting them within the sort of party through the party lens, I think is really what I'm trying to sort of bring to bear here in the discussion. Great. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you to everyone else who who responded to that question. Um, we have one from the audience, and this is most likely a best fit for the folks who contributed to the crisis management volume. Um, so the question asks, in the course of your research, was the suspicion that crisis management mechanisms are a U.S. ploy, does this perception exist across the spectrum from government officials to academics, or is there some understanding of what the United States is trying to build upon and trying to propose? Um, and then secondly, in the course of your research, were there examples of successful crisis mitigation response implementation that did not result in a positive outcome for US interests in which the United States would have been perceived to have, quote, gotten our way? Um, should I jump in? Yeah, please, David. And if anyone else wants to jump in, please go ahead as well. So, um, what I would say to the first part, I, I'll answer the first part of the question. Um, and I, I, I sort of address that in the chapter a little bit, which is that, um, yes, China, to some extent, uh, sees crisis management as actually managing conflicts and resolving problems only to some extent. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, and I explained that in the chapter, the goal is is primarily to advance Chinese interests. Um, but then in the course of the dialogues, track two, track 1.5, that I uh, run with um, um, Chinese scholars, what I've come to realize is that um, you have essentially two groups. One, typically of... Um, you know, essentially older Chinese scholars that know the crisis management literature, that believe in crisis management the same way the United States believes in it, um, and, you know, that the goal is, is managing problems and, and so on and so forth, and that tend to agree that there needs to be cooperation between the two countries uh, in this area. And you have another group uh, of Chinese typically younger Chinese scholars that do not believe that crisis management uh, is, is good for China or potentially good for China. And that does tend uh, to see crisis management as a problem and a trick that the United States wants, wants to 
uh, used to, again, prevail over China. And so that's the distinction that I see in dialogues. Um, in, in the course of the research, I didn't see um, a clear distinction between official PRC writings and scholars. Uh, as I said, the experience that I've had has been between, again, older Chinese scholars and, and younger Chinese scholars that seem to see the term, uh, I'm sorry, crisis management in, in different ways. So that's how, that's how I respond, I'd respond to that question. I think I can quickly chime in if I, if I may. Um, I think uh, 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 in addition to you know what David just said, you know there's a uh, there seems to be a generational difference with respect to you know the the role of you in the United States in crisis management. I think uh, in my chapter I also touched on touched on you know the role of U United States during the Scarborough standoff, uh, as you know revealed recently by you know Madame Fuying, who was you know a direct who was directly involved in. Uh, in the in negotiation with you know in uh, communications with the United States during the standoff, um, I think uh, it seems to the PRC that it perceived the role of U.S. Uh, you know in several ways during the crisis. It does see since it attached importance to you know at least make sure the U.S. remain uh, neutral. You know with respect to um, you know which which party is, is going to side or whether it it really you know quietly secretly backed. Uh, the, the, uh, the Philippines during the standoff, but also, you know, during another dispute, we know between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands, um, I, I, uh, I addressed that uh, in different uh, in different uh, project. It seems that, you know, previously, you know, uh, perhaps in around uh, 2010, um, the Chinese, uh, the PRC did perceive the U.S. Actually, as part of the, uh, you know, as a way of, you know, resolving uh, some some of the crises, like during the 2010 uh, fishing trawler incident, you know, it, it was the United States, it was, you know, the United States that stepped in and negotiated for a solution uh, that became later became mutually acceptable to both the Japanese and Chinese to to settle this dis dispute without further escalation. But I think. Uh, um, the Chinese perception on the on the role of the U.S. have been evolving, not just because. Uh, because because of the generational difference, but also, uh, you know, because their perception about the role of the United States per se has been changed, and also, you know, the the, uh, the PRC's relations with with the U.S. has been changed in, in a more fundamental way. So I think now, uh, the I think now uh, Chinese have been more uh, pessimistic or uh, see the U.S. role in a very different, more negative way uh, as to you know how. Uh, a, a more suspicious way as how the U.S. can, you know, uh, even help uh, or be uh, be part of, uh, be a constructive part in in in, in the crisis management uh, in in managing any crisis arising uh, between China and its small neighbors uh, in the on the maritime front. Thank you, Shushin. I'm glad you chimed in because I was just about to direct the question to you to see whether these genera generational differences are are perhaps more deeply embedded in the structural differences that, that have um, characterized the current state of crisis management right now. Um, so a broad question for everybody on the panel is from Xiao Xin Xue from Voice of America, which is with many military leaders getting purged or disappeared like Li Shangfu, and as we've seen with the PLA rocket force, how may China's recent military shakeup and reshuffle affect its crisis response and decision-making right now and then the second question, and I would point you to Drew Holiday's chapter in the most recent volume, which looks at the actual institutional mechanisms and control structures, which um, undergird the decision-making process. But the question is, could you help summarize the process of China's crisis response decision-making and behavior? What is the workflow? How does it work and how has it changed under Xi Jinping. So that's a loaded question with a lot of different components. So I wouldn't encourage any single person to take it all on at once, but perhaps we can piece that apart in the in the remaining five minutes that we have left. Um, so whoever would like to take a stab, just please clarify the question, uh, whether it's on the crisis response process or the military leader disappearances, and we can go from there.
Well, uh, in my research, one of my main arguments about some of the negative factors that are affecting uh, decision making at the strategic level is that uh, you know this move towards personalist dictatorship in China is is going to affect how uh, decision making uh, works on the CMC. So I see consolidated power and you know further politicize the PLA. Uh, I believe. You know, in the future, it's going to just be more or less his words against uh, everybody else's and his words will triumph. And uh, with the system of the uh, CMC chairman responsibility system, uh, you know, it's going to be she's power is going to grow further. And even, you know, you have, let's say in the future, you have uh, AI systems uh, providing certain types of advice uh, for uh, the strategic level, she is going to you know, believe in his infallibility and during crisis situations, uh, dictators tend to micromanage as we have, we have seen in, at, at the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war from the Russian side. So that could pose a uh, serious challenge to decision-making uh, at the strategic level in the future. I wanna echo those comments. Um, already, I think an examination of uh, crises in recent years uh, reveals a pattern of uh, PRC uh, unwillingness to quote pick up the phone. So there's a discussion over the over time of uh, various hotlines, various measures, but when they're actually needed most, the PRC side tends not to employ them, or at least uh, at least not initially. Now. Uh, for the reasons just described or connected to it anyway, the personalist leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, there's more uncertainty as to uh, who is actually around the phone in the greatest sense, uh, so to speak. What I've also gathered uh, from our discussion here and what I agree with uh, analytically is that broadly speaking, uh, PRC decision makers do not uh, share are not equal in enthusiasm or advocacy to U.S. and other Western co counterparts for uh, confidence building or crisis management measures to, to begin with. There tends to be a pattern of regarding those very measures with far greater uh, suspicion. So I'm afraid what this all adds up to is uh, a greater uh, increasing risks for which there is no uh, easy and straightforward way to uh, remedy. I, th I think we're in entering into a more risky and difficult uh, period. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't see the uh, the evidence to, to, to counter that view. Thanks, Andrew. And in just the remaining time, if anybody else would like to make any remarks on this question or on the topic of either China's approach to deterrence or the state of the U.S.-China crisis management more broadly, please go ahead. Um, otherwise, we can wrap I mean, this I up. Wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind um, sort of mentioning here that it, it seems to me that China's perception of what the U.S. intelligence community is knows about China seems to have um, its evalu China's evaluation is that the US um, sort of intelligence capability has improved, right? Um, and from what I'm seeing, there's a greater sense of paranoia in the way that China talks about its ability to contain and control uh, information across many different sectors, right? Not just the nuclear or the strategic conventional and you see that in a lot of sort of statements um, and how Xi Jinping talks about sort of mobilizing its people. Um, so I think that what it sees as a, as a growing threat and it tries to communicate that to its people of, of improved US intelligence capabilities. Um, I mean, I, I read a recent report, I think it was from maybe 2022 from Strider, which is a private consultancy, which do some very, very, very good work in my view. Um, and they they sort of presented uh, some interesting um, evidence, um, very compelling evidence of Los Alamos uh, Laboratory 
and and how Chinese um, were re were recruited into that and then were able to build um, their own sort of version of that in China itself and that ended up helping various programs military programs in China and the development of those and so I think there's a sense from the China end that those kind of openings are getting are being closed up and um, you know many countries not just America but here I'm I'm dining in from the UK and um, there are very serious um, discussions underway around how to tighten science and technology sectors um, in, in a similar vein so I'll end it there because we don't have time but but I think there's a growing awareness of improved capabilities um, um, in, in, in facing these challenges that China presents. Great. Well, thank you, Nicola, very much. And thank you again to all of the presenters here today um, for a fantastic discussion. It was very interesting, very engaging, and I think it certainly answered more questions than it left, which is always a positive from, from these types of events. And so if you do have any questions, I would again encourage you to check out MBR's website, mbr.org, and download these volumes for free. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us here today. And again, thank our seven contributors. And um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or with any suggestions for how MBR can help you. Um, so thank you again and have a good rest of your, your, your week. Thank you, everybody.